SUSE is a global leader in innovative, reliable, secure, enterprise-grade open-source solutions relied upon by more than 60% of the Fortune 500 to power their mission-critical workloads. They specialize in business-critical Linux, enterprise container management and edge solutions, and collaborate with partners and communities to empower customers to innovate everywhere, from the data center to the cloud to the edge and beyond. SUSE puts the open back in open source, giving customers the agility to tackle innovation challenges today and the freedom to evolve their strategy and solutions tomorrow. Welcome to Kubernetes Center of Excellence podcast, episode seven, I think. That sounds right. We've got uh, <clears throat> we've got some uh, new friends on the pod today. Uh, Ross Beard, he is new to this podcast. Uh, he's done some other things. We'll get him introduced in a second. And then we have Matt LeRae from SpeedScale. He's going to talk to us about how they're helping customers uh, with their offering. And we're super excited to have him on. Matt, thanks for joining. Great to be here. So we, you know, we usually like to start with, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about you, you know, what, what you've been doing. Maybe, uh, maybe it's an overall, like how you got your, how you got to SpeedScale, you know, with as much context as you'd like. Mm -hmm. We have plenty of time. Okay. Okay. My favorite topic. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Tell us. <sorry. laughs> so, okay. So yeah, about me. Um, I have been doing software engineering of various kinds for decades. Um, got started uh, early on working on things like graphics engines and really high performance systems. Uh, then I got hooked up with a company called Wiley Technology, which was one of the very first Java monitoring solutions. And uh, that kind of fit well with my worldview because I like to uh, I like to optimize and I like to uh, you know I like to wring performance out of um, complicated systems. So did that. Got bought by a big company. Um, ended up doing the, the big company thing for a while, and then uh, went back to startups um, and where I where I continued in the observability or monitoring space as we called it back then. Um, before we started SpeedScale, I was actually at a, uh, a monitoring company, a monitoring startup out of San Francisco. So um, I went to college in Atlanta, went out to San Francisco, uh, learned, learned a ton about not only just technology, but how to look at, look at like technology problems. Um, went out there. Uh, then uh, I was uh, informed by my wife that we would be moving back to Atlanta because uh, her father and her family's here. And uh, she, she, um, yep, she let me know that we would be going back to Atlanta which has actually been a great move for us. Um, and, but when I was coming back, I was kind of like, okay, what, what are we going to do here? Right. So in the observability and monitoring space there, you know, we have a, uh, we have a, like a wide variety or you can call it an embarrassment of riches, right? There are so many companies sure. doing, doing stuff that is, that is great in that space. And I knew I wanted to do a startup again, right? I didn't, I wasn't quite ready to go back to a big company yet. And I thought, okay, well, there's, there's so much has been covered by the monitoring space, but everybody's still having tons of problems. Um, everybody, these apps, they're getting shipped to production and they're breaking all the time. And then, so we've improved that system. We've said, okay, if you push something and it breaks out to production, then we'll, we have the sophisticated system of rollbacks and monitoring. Problem is, I don't know if you, if you guys saw, I don't want to, I don't want to pick on one of our partners because I, I, I love Datadog, but uh, they had a 12 hour outage yesterday. Um, I don't mm. know if everybody saw that. Um, and I don't know that we don't know the root cause of that yet. And uh, certainly they're, they're one of the better ones, right, as far as monitoring. Uh, but that system of just pushing things out to production and hoping that it uh, that it works is not the best way, uh, in my opinion. Um, not that that's what they're doing, but I mean, like a, a lot of companies, that's what they're doing. So uh, so I said, OK, well, let's rethink the problem from from sort of ground truth. Uh, why? Why are we having so many reliability problems with software? And. Uh, in my opinion, it's because uh, testing as currently practiced doesn't really work. Um, you're guessing, um, well, I guess there's, there's kind of like two ways of doing testing, right? Uh, way number one is let's hire a bunch of QA engineers, right? And uh, we won't give them enough resources or enough time, of course, but uh, we'll, we'll hire a bunch of QA engineers and then we will uh, we'll wait for them to test the software. They'll write all kinds of brittle test cases that break all the time, right? Well, they'll go and they'll try to mock out the environment or build integration test environments, which will also break all the time. And basically, uh, we'll have real slow releases and we'll drive ourselves towards monolithic architectures and no one's real happy with that. And it doesn't, doesn't really work, right? So I said, okay, well, what are the new cloud companies doing? When I say cloud companies, I mean companies that are uh, like, like your background, Nick, you know, they're, they're doing Kubernetes, right? 
or right. they were sort of born in the cloud. Well, born in the cloud means you're releasing constantly, right? Um, right. You know, and, and anything that gets in the way of releasing has got to get ripped out. Well, those companies have sort of ripped out a lot of their testing people and they're suffering the consequences as a result. They're getting all kinds of reliability issues. But so what their answer to that question uh, is, let's go and um, let's try to test in production. Let's roll back fast, like I was saying. So, and that requires super, super experienced and skilled engineers to do those two things. And so I said, uh, along with my co-founders, um, Ken Aarons and Nate Lee, we said, you know, there's got to be a better way. And so that's where we came up with this idea of production traffic replay. And the long and short of it, I can talk about it. I've been talking for a while, but I can, uh, I can talk about <laughs> it some more, uh, is that production traffic replay is, a, is essentially a, a technology that allows us to replicate production, ex, production, um, uh, the production environment and data exactly inside of a pre-production environment. So that means uh, we can go and copy the dependencies but we do it in sort of a novel way. Instead of, when, when I say copy dependencies, I mean, you know, people think, oh, you mean like you're copying databases. Nope, we're not doing that stuff. Uh, or they say, oh, well, you're creating test cases to run against the, the app. Nope, we're not doing that stuff. What we do is we record the actual network traffic. We operate the network level and we, mi- we mimic the real systems in pre-production. So Gotcha. So you're basically simulating load against the application. We're simulating the load, yep, and then we're also simulating the downstream systems that that the the service relies upon. Got it. Okay. So it's two sides. Yep. Interesting. I've I've got a I've got a few questions <laughs> offhand. Yeah. So you said Wiley was uh where what you did early early back in the day like CA Wiley. Yeah, before I had gray hair. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Yeah. So you you spent some time in the um. Yeah, in the monitoring world, before we came up with new funky terms like observability and yeah, site reliability engineering and performance monitoring and blah blah blah, all those things, right? All the words that we have to teach our customers about. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I take it you know Wiley, or you you've seen this in the past. Um, yeah, so um, I didn't have, have any direct experience with Wiley, but I knew that they were uh, an early player. So <clears throat> I kind of got introduced into this space. Um, kind of when app dynamics at the market and new yep. relic right after them. So that's when it became relevant to, you know, our company back in the day. Um, we have some preferences now that we mm-hmm. like to, you know, guide customers to Donna trace being one of them. Yeah. Which is kind of funny because, you know, you know, I think the, you know, back in the day, the app dynamics thing kind of like really challenged Donna trace and um, mm-hmm. made them rethink the way they saw the world. And they ended up rebuilding their platform a few years ago. Yeah, and now they're uh, they're back to crushing since they were they were kind of you know the the OGs of tracing. So that was uh, I you know it's funny. I, I talked to a lot of the open telemetry, open tracing folks, and mm-hmm. uh, I say if you ever want to see the right way to do tracing, tracing, go look at Dynatrace's product because they they figured out uh, like you know this is me. I mean, I was competing against them at the time, but you know right. you have to appreciate what's good about all of those companies now. Now we're customers, right or whatever, but. Um, right. They figured out how to do a type of tracing with low overhead that really, um, really kind of everybody had to follow. It was pretty impressive. Um, yeah, I mean they were yeah. they were innovating early, and from everything I can tell, they're innovating again. Um, I mean their platform is pretty insane, like what they can actually do. You so. know, I, I did a long stand in product management, and I, that's kind of what I do at SpeedScale as well. I'm a CTO, but I also, you know, it's not like we're big enough to have separate functions yet, and. Uh, I've always been impressed with uh, Dynatrace's ability to adapt to new environments because most companies, when you have a huge architecture shift, uh, that's it, game over, <laughs> right? You know, you, you, right. you can't adapt to the new architecture, but they've, they've done pretty well keeping, they've been through one or I guess two major architecture shifts and still still doing well, so. Yeah, and yeah. adding and, you know, really seem seeming to, uh, you know, connect the things that I think customers think are important and trying mm-hmm. to make it easier for them, right? So I was just out at Perform about a month ago, and uh, okay, that was a that was a hell of a show. I was I was pretty impressed. Um, a lot of good information, a lot of smart people. So it's uh, you know, I cool. think they've got some cool things that are uh, you know, coming to the you know the front for everybody. So anyway, let's get back to you. Um, okay. The so you guys are addressing 
before we get before we get out to production, which yeah. you know maybe this is another question I'll ask, and this will be the end of my uh, technical uh, attempt. But um, I've always I've always thought this: lots of customers want to put APM on production. They're right. like, oh, we got to make sure our production's working. Mm-hmm. And I would argue that needs to be before production. That needs to yep. be in pre-production because why would you want to learn about you know, getting deep into the code and seeing where there's inefficiencies or things that fall over in production. You want to, you want to do that in pre-production. Yeah. And then, and then if you're, you know, doing an offset of cost, maybe you have like a, you know, really, a really sharp metric monitor, which tends to be a lot cheaper yeah. on the production side. Right. So do you have any specific thoughts around like how customers approach monitoring from that, that perspective? Yeah. So um, the, I spent a lot of time in that world and I still do a lot of our, we're partnered with all the major um, uh, or most of the major uh, APM and monitoring companies. Uh, From my experience, there's, okay. So, so, you know, I've built products from the ground up and I've also taken over products that were already sick. (laughs) Um, And uh, the thing with monitoring or observability is that you start off needing a high level view of what's happening in the system. Is it broken? And a good analogy for that, at least I think, as you said, is metrics monitoring. And so you can go a long way just having metrics, right? Um, sure. Because it'll, you can say, okay, response times are high or error counts are high or whatever. And it's easy to code. There's a lot of uh, you know, exhaust that you get from the application. Like if you're in AWS, for instance, or GCP or whatever, you can, you know, there's all kinds of metrics that come from the infrastructure that are just kind of free, right? And right. so that's a great starting point. Um, in my experience, what happens usually is, okay, we got the metrics, we know something's wrong, but metrics are not detailed enough to know what, what is wrong most of the time. Not always, but most of the time. And then you go and you say, okay, well, I want to dive into the application. And the easiest way to do that is just collect all the logs and then allow a log management solution to look for correlations or whatever. Um, and, then, uh, and then you can kind of get, get a deeper visibility. And uh, that is, that's where most companies stop, I think, uh, at least in my experience, it's because it's because the next step is, is a lot more difficult, um, which is adding tracing. Now, if you're not invested in a professional tracing tool like, a, like Dynatrace, you mentioned AppDynamics, um, obviously a lot of them have these tools now. If you're not invested in that, th- th- you have to put quite a bit of effort into adding tracing. And the value is, is pretty high, it, it, the more distributed your system is. So the more moving parts it has, the more tracing has value. But you know, a lot right. of people don't really have systems that are that, are that distributed, that are that you know, they don't, they didn't work at Google and they don't have, you know, these massive scale things. And so like tracing is not, you know, it's kind of like a, um, a lot of people aren't investing in it at that point. Sure. And, um, you know, from, from my perspective, it's interesting you said APM, um, a lot of folks now, you know, it's observability, right. Versus APM, right. The, the terminology changes, but a right. lot of the tooling yep. stays the same, um, or at least gets in updated, I should say. Um, a lot of what we do at SpeedScale is actually uh, we think of it like an APM tool where where you can sort of see the future in production. So our product has a lot of these capabilities like your, you know, your metric system or your log collection or whatever, but it's in pre-production where we're, we're pretending to be in production. And so you can get it. It looks like an APM tool because that's the world we're from. Right. So. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, I'm sorry, I kind of went through a maturity curve, but I'm watching, I was actually just doing this with SpeedScale. <laughs> we're updating our own monitoring actually right now because we're going, we're, we're experiencing a, a, an influx of, let's say, of new users, right? Quite a bit of, uh, you know, an influx. And so we're like, okay, this is not working anymore. We're getting woken up in the middle of the night. We got we to gotta have our game here um, around monitoring or observability. So. Got it. Ross. Hey, Matt, uh, question for you. Can you, can you share... So some um, insights with, say, you know, the types of customers that are really seeing a lot of value in, in your product and sort of help us understand, you know, what exactly they're using it for and um, maybe what they were doing prior to your tool uh, in terms of, you know, the problem that you're solving. Yeah. So, so uh, we generally speed scale is most valuable for uh, medium to large size companies that have a revenue generating application. So um, if, if you're just a, a shop, like we went through something called Y Combinator, which is like a startup incubator out of the West Coast. We did that with SpeedScale. And what we found is we went in and we said, okay, this is going to be great. We're going to sell to like 300 startups and it's all going to be awesome. And we're going to catapult out. And we sold like five of them. <laughs> and uh, what we learned is that 
um, in order, so in order for you to need production replay, I mean, everybody can use it, but in order for it to sort of be, the juice to be worth the squeeze, uh, you have to have more than one team, more than one agile team. It doesn't have to be 50. It doesn't have to be 300 people or anything, but it has to be enough people that there is drift between APIs, right? Mm -hmm. So this, well, a lot of what, um, so coming to the kind of a specific customer stories, a lot of times where folks get started is, uh, is with stress testing in Kubernetes or elsewhere, you know, OpenShift or Docker or whatever it is. Um, you know, we support all those things. We talk a lot about Kubernetes, but obviously we, we support all the other stuff as well. But they come and they say, I, had, I need to stress test this because I've got too much load. So, excuse me, um, one example was uh, that we were, uh, one, one example of that was a, a fast food restaurant, which I don't have permission to say their name, so I won't, but it is a very large one uh, that we love, that are fantastic partners with us. Um, they have a lunch rush coming, right? And during COVID, they were getting slammed because people were suddenly going through drive throughs or ordering, ordering online. And so um, they needed to figure out how much load they could handle. And SpeedScale was an easy way to go and record and then multiply traffic and make it look like it was 100,000 users instead of just 5,000 users and see how well it was going to hold up. And then they run it with all those APM-like metrics and they get the visibility. And so that, that's kind of a starting point for a lot of folks. Um, I would say that as, as companies get a little, as they get a little deeper into using the, our product, what they really figure out, though, is that the load testing, yes, we do it easier than everybody else, and it's all that good stuff. But what's really important is the simulation or mocking of back-end services. So mm -hmm. I'm working with a company right now that has a gigantic Salesforce footprint, meaning um, they're using Salesforce APIs like crazy. And it, you know, it's weird. If you look at Salesforce earnings, uh, like their stock is doing pretty well, because apparently that's super expensive uh, to, use, to use tons <laughs> and tons of Salesforce. And, you know, they, they charge by the seat and their API has rate limits and all this other stuff, you know, going on. Um, so they're sitting there saying, you know, we can't develop against this because we can't test realistic scenarios. So we come in and we say, well, we'll, we'll record, you know, we're like, uh, we're listening in on your phone, so to speak, uh, but in a non-creepy way. Uh, and we're recording all the conversations going on with, with Salesforce. We'll pretend to be Salesforce, but we're going to be one tiny little container that costs almost nothing to run, right, from an infrastructure standpoint. So we're going to record, you know, we're going to replicate you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of Salesforce calls, but we're going to do it for, you know, for almost nothing, right? Um, so that's kind of where people go. So uh, so first thing is, you know, generally people start with stress testing and load testing. Then they move into like a full, it's like an integration test without an integration test environment. Um, another way of thinking of it, if you heard the phrase ephemeral environments, um, mm -hmm. so we, we get lumped in with ephemeral environments and we're happy to be lumped in a lot of cases because, we don't solve the problem from an infrastructure perspective. We solve the data problem, which is actually the harder problem. Um, not to not to demean anything that the infrastructure, you know, the ephemeral service companies are doing. I mean, it's you know, certainly there, there's a lot of complexity in what they're doing. But getting the data into those ephemeral environments is what SpeedScale focuses on. And so, um, so anyway, so that's kind of you know, that's that's what one you know, what a lot of customers use us for. There's another kind of use case though that we actually uh, have, well, we're, we're doing with pretty much everybody now, but some of our public companies like a, like a, an Ilus or a, um, uh, actually I can't use their name either, but, uh, but uh, some of our public case studies, um, they are, uh, what they're doing now is they're taking the production backend systems and moving it onto the developer desktop. So as an example, sorry, I'm on call there. Uh, as an example, uh, the, they'll take and they'll record into production and then they will take our little mini container that pretends to be all those Salesforce and all those backend systems. And they'll let the developers actually run their code in a debugger against the local version of that. It's like, oh, it's like skinning down Salesforce and all the other stuff, the databases and all skinning it way down into just one container they run on their desktop. So that's kind of, that's getting popular for us as well. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That, that's interesting. Follow yeah, up question. And then I'll pass <laughs> back to you, Nick. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, is there like a compelling moment? Say you mentioned a few customers there, like the, uh, the, the restaurant chain where they're thinking, okay, we really need to shift the way that we, you know, go about this, um, you know, you know reliability and, and the testing, um, you know, I'm curious if there's like a strategic shift that the company's making to be a little bit more proactive about this, or perhaps they've run into too many of those problems during the lunch rush. Uh, any sort of insights into that compelling moment you can share? Yeah. Um, so our best customers, one, one, uh, our best customers generally are people who have already tried. So, so what they've done is they've moved to cloud native development of some kind, right? Kubernetes or 
EC2 or whatever it is, um, they've moved there and they've already tried. And they tried to bring their testing practice with it and they failed miserably. Or they tried to test and prod and realized that uh, the systems are on fire and everybody's quitting and all the horrible stuff's happening because they got rid of their testing, but they, then they thought they were going to shift in. So one example of that, uh, there's a company, a uh, makeup company called Sephora. They're a public, uh, you know, we can talk about them. They are a, uh, they have a very, very forward leaning CTO. His name is Shri. And the moment he saw speed scale, he goes, oh yes, that's the, that's, that's a real problem. That's the thing. Because he had already tried, they had been migrating, they're migrating hundreds of microservices over from like, they're basically breaking up a monolith, right? Um, which is like taking a big piece of code and chopping it into pieces. And they had already been through the trusting problem, right? And so then they, he, you know, he immediately got it, right? What was going on. And those are generally our best customers is people who have already tried to bring the old practices with them and have figured out, you know, the limitations of that uh, way of thinking. Um, generally, it's a, like I said, it's useful for startups, but, um, you, you know, you got 15, 20 engineers. That's when the, that's when the power really starts to kick in. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So it's a fundamental sort of shift in the way that you, you know, go about this, this testing that, um, you know, makes people think a little bit differently. That's really interesting. So Matt, let me ask you this. So I'm not super knowledgeable in the test world, test QA world. It's not, it's not something we specifically do here. <clears throat> you know, there's companies that, uh, specialized just in that i mean it's a big old business oh yeah so about 40 billion dollars actually according to my yeah, venture capital yeah. that, uh, <laughs> and you know you never lie on anything like that no 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 it's uh market cap's huge oh. so you know i i mean i may know you know a couple of the bigger kind of solutions around testing qa so like i think of like tricentis mm -hmm. um but i'm not super familiar with that space so what are you guys doing different that like a large tool suite like Tricentis maybe isn't doing? Like, I'm, I'm sure you probably have some uh, te technology market analysis around that. Yeah. That would yeah, help I me mean, as a user, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to, um, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't like cast any shade on Tricentis. They've built a big business uh, with lots and lots of products and what they're doing. Um, but those products were born uh, pre-cloud, right? Right. So um I don't want to pick on anybody current, let's just say, but um, you remember the old Load Runner stuff from um, yeah, yeah. So Load Runner was was dominant in its day, just a fantastic tool for the way people built software 15, 20 years ago, right? And so I think a lot of our competitors, uh, you know, they they fall into that category. Um, it's not that the tools don't work. It's not that they don't do what they promise to do. It's just that the process has changed too much, right? Sure. And so. Um, there's an old saying, one of the venture capitalists I used to work with, he, he had a saying, architecture is destiny. And I've learned largely that to be learned that to be largely accurate, is that if you build a set of testing products or any other product around a certain set of assumptions, one of those assumptions being, we're going to have a test suite. The test suite will be managed by a, QA, a set of QA testers, right? We are going to release software on a periodic basis, as opposed to, you know, just rolling straight to production like the modern, you know, like the, the cloud native stuff does. Um, you're going to build your testing software in a very specific way, right? Around those assumptions. Speed scale doesn't look anything like that. You know, we don't have a software test suite interface. We don't have, you know, one thing that my co-founder Ken says a lot is uh, um, there's no new, uh, file new test uh, menu option in speed scale where you go and write tests and all this manual stuff. We take more of the Kubernetes approach and, uh, you know, Nick, I know your company does some work with Kubernetes and cloud native. Um, uh, I don't remember who originally said it, but I, I heard it from Kelsey Hightower, who is a very famous Kubernetes um, evangelist um, and a lot smarter than me. But uh, he said, uh, you know, pets versus cattle, right? So the old world was, in the old world, you built technology sets that were like pets. It was like this, this carefully curated, you, you dress them, you hug them, you love them, you make sure they go to the vet or whatever. Right? Uh, but the Kubernetes model is everything, technology is all cattle, right? They're servers, they get they get, you know, they get uh, slaughtered, they get sent to whatever, and then new ones come around, they do whatever. And that's the, that's the appropriate model for Kubernetes. And, um, and I, I agree with that. And the thing, the thing is, a lot of the tools you mentioned, without, you know, uh, getting into specifics about any, you know, each of them, they are built for this idea of these curated sort of tests. And speed scale is designed with, around the idea of, hey, your production system changed? No problem. Blow everything away. We'll make a new recording. And then that's going to be your new test suite. Right. And, and you can do that 
Like we have some customers, for instance, that generate an entirely new recording of production every hour. And so if you're a developer and you say, oh, what's the latest and greatest? I need some serious, like realistic users. No problem. Just hit the button, grab the last hour snapshot, right, of all that. And you can go and have real users running against your code. Or you can uh, run a report, like you were saying, more like an APM type style, where you say, what's my latency? How's it changed? Build over build. Just take whatever the latest and greatest straight out of production. It's more of like a, it's designed to be ephemeral. Everything is everything is uh, is just in time. Gotcha. Okay, that's no, that's that's super helpful. I think uh, it's tough to be good at lots of things, and you know the whole testing QA world, especially if we're talking about uh, you know pre Kubernetes and public cloud. Um, mm -hmm. Not a world I, I played in a whole lot, so it's it's great to have that understanding. Well, my personal um, strategy has been to be mediocre at many things. Uh, <laughs> I found that it's it's much easier to fail upwards when uh, when you're mediocre at a lot of things. <laughs> That's funny. I like that. Just kidding. <laughs> funny enough, um, you know, another quote from Kelsey Hightower that I heard about a month ago. Mm -hmm. He was talking about observability. Yeah. And um, I'm going to butcher this, so it's fine. <clears throat> but he basically said observability has been, it's like innate in us as people since uh we got here on the planet and i was okay. you know i was kind of drawn in i was like okay where are you going with this mm -hmm. he was like you know like we'd we'd be in groups of people in early human civilization and uh we'd find a place to settle and then we'd send uh a person or two up to the top of the hill to make sure nothing was coming to get us <laughs> and i was like man that's why that guy crushes i mean he's just, just does such a good job with uh analogies around like really complex things and going it's actually not that complex which is really cool um but Except uh, for Kubernetes yeah, he, the hard way that was actually hard <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah yeah well you know it's it's funny he has such such a great reputation we actually we actually worked with him way way back in the day before he was you know distinguished engineer um of the googles so uh he's a really great dude and um, yeah it's uh you know yeah, that's that's like crazy. the sign of genius right is when you can take a super complicated uh, set of problems and distill it down to just like one or two or three, you know, core components. And he has kind of a knack for that. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, helps that he's like good at speaking and talking and stuff that helps too. <laughs> so, um, yeah. well, let's, uh, I always like to ask this question. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're a technologist, you've been doing this a while. Mm -hmm. uh, what is something that you're curious to see if you're like looking around the corner, like what's a bet you would make around, it can just be in technology in general. It doesn't have to be about test or, you know, the new platform architectures we're all playing with, just something you're excited to potentially see, or, you know, you, you have, you'd put a warm bet on this could be a thing in a few years. And I just put you Good on the question. spot. So. so I did a talk at KubeCon last year on eBPF. I don't know if you're familiar with eBPF. Have no, but tell this? us all about it. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, uh, coming back to Kelsey and the the going up to the top of the hill and looking around, right? Um, the problem of observability and monitoring, there's kind of two major problems that you have to solve if you want to make a good system for that. The first one is uh, you have to understand how everything connects together. So the more sophisticated your graph, so to speak, of all the, the you know, the leg bones connected to the thigh bone and all that, the, the more sophisticated that graph is, the better you're going to be at problem solving, Right. The second thing you can do is get deeper visibility into an individual component. And uh, that can be super useful for a lot of reasons. And EPPF is, I think, is a, is a creating a discontinuity in what's possible, meaning there was everything that came before. And then once EBPF is mature, which it's, it's not mature yet, but it's getting there, um, EBPF creates this stepwise change in what's possible. Um, it allows you, so right now everybody's focused on security because uh, it can do deep packet inspection without TLS keys. That's not magic. You have to let it in. I mean, you, know, have, you have to give it permissions to do so. But it actually right. will look into the Linux kernel and into the OpenSSL libraries and grab the packets as they're going through because it is, it is embedded into the kernel in a, rel in a pretty safe way. Um, so you don't, like you were mentioning about uh, uh, like tracing, for instance, right? Right. Uh, okay, well then put an EPPF listener on the network, the network stack right? Because it can go into the kernel and grab things. And then you can piece it together and figure out what happened. Um, I think that's, a ch that's, a, that's going to uh, fundamentally change the way that we do a lot of uh, introspection 
around, uh, um, you know, around all systems, but Kubernetes in particular, um, because I think that a lot of the, the systems that I deal with with customers, uh, they have so many pods running, so many namespaces, so many Kubernetes artifacts, right, going. It is almost impossible to reason about for a human anymore. Um, you know, it's so complicated, all the stuff that's happening and the interactions with the hardware. And then, oh, you know, the hardware has been moved. And, you know, this, the, the hard drive, you know, we changed our service level on our, on our uh, you know, we're not using the fastest block storage anymore. Now we're at a cheaper level, whatever. All these things are happening so quickly that I think things like eBPF are going to be uh, you know, transformative in understanding what's happening at the very, you know, the very lowest levels of the system. Um, there's a bunch of thought leaders around that. Um, there's uh, most companies are building an eBPF agent at this point to try to get into that. Uh, security companies, but also monitoring companies. Um, New Relic bought a company called Pixie uh, for eBPF. I know Datadog's been diving into that. I know that uh, I, I, given Dynatrace's history, I would be shocked if they aren't also building something, you know, around that or whatever. Um, but so that I think is going to change the game quite a bit. Um, and gotcha. I would bet on that. Yeah, I mean, there, there seems to be a um, a heavy correlation between observability and um, and security practices and security tools kind of starting to overlap. Yeah, and um, that makes sense because it kind of fits under that umbrella. At the end of the day, sometimes an actual attack, um, you know, leads to system and application failure, right? That's that's where we end up. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense for these companies to start building in some of those capabilities so that your, you know, your observability system, your monitoring system is kind of operating um, as a single place for maybe the people using it. So, yeah, it's, uh, um, now I'll, I'll be a contrarian against what you just said, actually, is that, uh, um, so for the longest time, we've thought of like uh, security and observability coming together. And I think a lot of what you said is true, personally, but, um, but uh, while they have many things in common, uh, like we're both cranky, both security people and those are really people, you know, modern people, we're all cranky. Um, there's a lot that's in common, but I also think that um, security has its own concerns, like compliance concerns that come to like regulation and legal stuff that, sure. you know, it's still, let's just say they have a bright future ahead. Uh, <laughs> yeah. like, there's a lot of job security, I think, in uh, being a person who knows about all that stuff uh, for, for quite some right. time. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that's, you know, that's... um that's not always top of mind. Like when you think about security, like security is so much more about compliance and framework than it is mm -hmm. about like the actual locking down of something. Right. So um, I've spent some time, you know, selling to the federal government and they're, they're way more concerned about their paperwork than they are. It seems sometimes is my system actually secure. <laughs> so sometimes it stifles innovation, but I think when we start taking, when these tools start working uh, together, in a way that makes sense. Yeah. Like the old adage that we tell a lot of customers is like, hey, don't don't go build something and then like tell security at the end when you're ready to go to prod. Mm -hmm. That's dumb. Like get them involved early so that they can say, here's some requirements we have. We'd like to understand. Um, we, we'd like to have an opinion. And then you don't have to go do a bunch of rework. You know, it's like, a, it's it's a maturity model around delivering software. Are we going to build things with security in mind? Are we going to build things with uh, that are elegant, you know, at the end of the day? Yeah. I think that's probably the big thing that um, hopefully some of these solutions and tools in the marketplace mm -hmm. will help, um, you know, developers and, you know, engineer, infrastructure engineers start thinking about like, how do I make something elegant instead of how do I just make something? Yeah. And um, I think one of the ways you do that is through like, you know, offering speed scale, right? you're doing the work on the front end to make sure it's not going to fall over and collapse when it goes out. You, gotta, you know, it's interesting. One of the questions we get asked a lot with speed scale is, do you do security use cases? And of course the answer is, well, we can replay things, but we're not specifically focused on security um, as a concern yet. But, um, you know, when we sell to, you know, when we pitch our story, of course, uh, we go, well, yes, but we could, we could eventually take over the world. Um, but uh, at the moment, we are going to uh, our plans for world domination don't extend to security just yet. Uh, but right. uh, <laughs> uh, you, you, know, you triggered a thought, actually. Um, have you ever heard of uh, there was a, a very there was for a while a very famous talk at Monitorama by a guy by the name of James Mickens. It's called Computers no. Are a Sadness and I and I Am the Cure. Have you ever heard about this talk? No, but sounds oh. interesting. Oh, this is this is this is uh, I mean, James Mickens, you know, it's uh, he's a. Uh, Obviously, a luminary in the field. 
I'm just kidding, but this is one of the best talks ever. Uh, is he, he goes <laughs> and he says, so through it, he says, okay, Microsoft, they're working on their cloud at the time, right? And he says, okay, we're, we're trying to build security processes, like you said, right? Like we're trying to build those things in. But we had to realize at a certain point that whoever's trying to break into us is either Mossad or not Mossad. Um, Mossad is the Israeli security <laughs> force. He said, if it's Mossad, sorry, that's it. They're going to get through. Uh, if it's not Mossad, you can, then you can, you can hope to stop. <laughs> right. And gotcha. it's kind of like, I think a lot of organizations have, uh, have kind of like thrown their hands up a little bit around security. Like, you know, it's not, and you have to, uh, to your point, you have to, you have to think through the, you build it in from the ground up. Um, right. So one of the things at speed scale, we deal with a lot of sensitive information. We try to get, filter it all out. We have a data loss prevention engine that prevents data from getting sent anywhere, even to other environments inside of a customer's, uh, you know, we try to keep, keep all the sensitive stuff in production only. And um, one of the things we had to do, though, is our system is designed for uh, extreme data segregation from the beginning. So if customers send things to us, their their data does not commingle with other um, with other customers' data, as long as they're a paying customer. You know, like our, our free tier is different, right. which we do have a free tier. So feel free to go try it out. But um, uh, but you have to design it. Like your whole our whole infrastructure as code system is built for this, right? You have to do it from the ground up. Uh, encryption at rest, encryption in transit, um, encryption, uh, you know, uh, figuring out who can see what, right, from an R RBOC or a, uh, like a permissions perspective. This stuff, you got to build it in from the ground up because if you don't, you know, you're, you're always going to be playing catch up. And so we have been pretty fortunate on that. We have had our share of people trying to hack in, but nobody, nobody's even gotten close so far, which is not an invitation for anyone listening. Please, that's not an invitation. Right. Don't, don't say that out loud. There's no telling yeah. what people <laughs> we, might do. Especially Masad, right. if you're listening, don't don't hack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Shadowsoft, a leading Kubernetes systems integrator, is excited to announce the launch of Kubernetes Academy, a free online education platform to teach the skills needed to become proficient in Kubernetes. The Shadowsoft Kubernetes Academy platform offers courses and resources for learners of all levels. From beginners just starting to learn about containerization to experienced professionals looking to dive deeper into the intricacies of Kubernetes. Kubernetes Academy is now available at academy.shadowsoft.com. Start learning today and join the thousands of IT professionals already on the path to becoming Kubernetes experts. Shadowsoft helps you make optimal possible. All right, we're back with Ross and Matt from Speedscale. Uh, we're going to wrap up in a minute, but a couple, a uh, couple more things. So, Matt, I, I saw that you guys had a uh, had a raise recently. Um, any big plans um, that you can share? There might be things you can't share, but you know, you guys hiring a bunch, or you got some new new ideas around your offering that you're hoping to attack. Just curious, what you can share? Yeah, no, we're actually not very secretive uh, at Speedscale. We're pretty. Uh, um, pretty open about what's going on. So um, to your, uh, to what you referenced there, Nick, we recently announced, I think it was Monday, in fact, we did a press release that we have raised 9 million in total funding, um, including uh, West Coast, East Coast, uh, North VCs. Uh, so Grow Tech Ventures, um, you know, hats off to those guys, as well as Tech Square Ventures, Sierra out of, uh, out of Silicon Valley, Sierra Ventures. Um, as well as some uh, local investors like Tommy Noonan of Internet Security Systems fame. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to miss some people, but we love you all. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't have the list in front of me, but, um, you know, uh, angel investors, et cetera. So we're about $9 million. And we are a little bit different than a lot of other companies in that we worked on product market fit and building a, a technology that actually works uh, before scaling up. And now we're starting to scale up. So... Um, our stuff, uh, you know, we want to make sure it would actually work because it's never been done before. Um, to my knowledge, at least, no one has ever built a production replay system that works under large, you know, like a, or under different scenarios. Um, the closest thing is like Twitter built something called Diffy, which is open Diffy now. Um, there's, a, there's a really great uh, free open source product called Go Replay, um, which, uh, you know, it, it works, but it's not, it's not like a product, if that makes sense, you know, but it's, it's a great, um, like a great open source project for, for things. But we've kind of built this thing that actually will do the data transformations, help handle authentication, all these really thorny problems that are really difficult to solve. We went through and did that. So now what we're using the $9 million for is to uh, make someone other than uh, the co-founder's parents actually know we exist. 
So um, <laughs> my, my mom loves us. Uh, she's a lovely lady. She loves us. Uh, but I would like for someone else to love us as well. And so what we were, we're focused on right now on spending that money is on marketing. We've actually just had a, our first marketing hire start, um, sales, and then also engineering. But we've been a very engineering focused company for a while. So we're, we're in fact, every single person at the company was, a, was an engineer uh, up until like a month ago. So, um, so anyway, we're pushing that. Um, we're going to keep pushing, uh, uh, well, I should say the, the fundraise also allows us to open up a free tier, which um, if you go to our website and you can hit, uh, I think it just says try now button, right? Uh, you can get in, you can, you can use the product, you can get value out of the product and you don't have to pay us uh, to get started. And that's, that's a perpetually free tier, if you will. So we're doing that. It's allowing us to do that, having the funding um, and then uh, expand and go to market and then um, world domination. That's the, well, of course, the next thing. So. <laughs> Got it. So would hey. we expect you, well, Rob, Yes, Ross has got a question. Okay. I love it. I just want to say congrats on the raise, and yeah, it sounds like some exciting times ahead. Uh, curious how you found the Atlanta tech scene. You know, I think we've been sort of growing steadily over the last sort of five, ten years. I think there's some capital coming in and some really good success stories. Mm-hmm. You know, how have you found it? Um, won the scene, and then one sort of raising capital here. Uh, it is it, everything's changed in the last three years. Um, so I started, when I started working for Wiley, which my, was my first Bay Area company, this is in 2006. Generally speaking, if you were going to do a hard tech product, which is what SpeedScale is, it is, is a difficult technical product. It's not like we're building a, a website for event planners or something. You know, not that that's not great. It's just not like a hard technical problem. It's, these are solved problems at this point. Um, so, but if you're going to do that, generally you had to go to Silicon Valley. And so when, I, when we tried to fundraise years and years ago for another company, they said, yeah, this is a great idea. This is great. You guys seem great. Um, so when are you moving to San Francisco? And it's like, okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, and that was the game. But um, with, uh, with the last three years, things have changed. Y Combinator opened up and they actually invested in us, even though we were in Atlanta, they didn't, they didn't care. They're, so they're now, they're now doing remote batches, or at least they were. Interesting. Um, the money is willing to come to the Southeast in a way it wasn't. And when I say the money, I mean, uh, there are West Coast VCs will invest here. If you have if you have a quality of company you know like uh, that is worthy of that investment because they want to do they want to do high scale or whatever and so that that's a huge shift and it is an enormous opportunity for for engineers in Atlanta um, to stay in a place where the cost of living is much lower right than the Bay Area but you can still build out that ecosystem that you need so some of the leaders on that I think and I'm gonna miss some I'm sorry you know but just off the top of my head. You have, uh, you have places like ATDC, which is next to Georgia Tech, um, and you have uh, various VCs there. Um, obviously, the one you know has invested in us, which is TechSquare Ventures. Um, they've been a great partner for us, um, and they, they get it, if that makes sense. Like they, you know, these are sort of newer VCs that actually get the technology space. Um, there's also ATV, or Atlanta Tech Village up on Lenox. I don't have a, a strong relationship with them, but we, you know, they've certainly produced. I think Calendly came out of there. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, yeah, sales, sales loft came out of there. Um, yep. Yeah, a b- bunch, of, bunch of places. And, and I'll also say shout out uh, for some of the companies in Atlanta. So one of the things that's magical about the Bay Area when you go there is that everyone is trying to help each other out in a, in a way. There's a, this high degree of network connectivity between all the different folks. And so when somebody starts doing something innovative, you start hearing about it really quickly. And I'll say like, you know, um, companies like Calendly, you know, shout out, we, we, we've done, uh, we don't work with them, but we've, we've interacted with them quite a bit. They really have been putting a lot of investment into bringing engineers uh, at a very, very junior level and advancing their careers and pushing them forward. And so that's great for Atlanta because uh, what was always told, what was told to me by the, the Silicon Valley VCs is that um, I don't, you don't need one person with a billion dollars. You need a thousand people with a million dollars. Because the person with a million dollars wants to make more money and they're going to go invest in a bunch of different stuff. And all these flowers are going to start to bloom because everybody, they're all, you know, you, you can convince somebody who sees the world the same way you do instead of just a few power players. If that makes sense. Atlanta's not there yet, right, uh, as far as having too many of those. But, um, but they are starting to emerge. You know, you have, you have people that are getting that ethos. And so I am extremely bullish on um, I'm not just Atlanta, you know, there's Austin and Boston and, you know, Denver, and there's great things going on all over the, all over the nation and the world. But um, 
I'm very optimistic about what's happening in Atlanta and the open mindedness that's starting to come here. And uh, I feel like it's a great place to build a company, a tech company. Yeah, I mean, that's it's great uh, to see you, you're having all the success. Yeah, I do want also clear is that, uh, so we raised $9 million, but I don't actually have the $9 million because that was a question <laughs> I got on another podcast. The guy goes, you must be looking to get in another house. And I'm like, no, no, the company has it. I, I don't have $9 million. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to say lunch on you, but <laughs> exactly. it's not. Yeah. yeah, our investors would have a problem with that, I think. So. <laughs> that's. But thank you. That's thank funny. you, Ross. <laughs> well, I think there's... um. You know, I think Atlanta is one of the best kept secrets in the country for lots of reasons. Um, we've got a giant, you know, commercial economy here, mm-hmm. an unbelievable one, um, probably underrepresented if you looked at it on a map. And um, and with that, you know, I think there'll be great tech companies and people with lots of great ideas. We obviously have one of the best engineering schools in the country here. So mm-hmm. and, and a couple of other good ones regionally. So. You must uh, be in UGA. No, I'm just kidding. I went to Georgia. Tech, so what's yes, yes. The uh, <laughs> the agricultural engineering at UGA. That's correct. No, no. UGA is a great school, actually. Now, jokes aside, it's a fabulous school. No, they <laughs> are. No, they they absolutely are. They actually have a, a decent uh, a decent little CS program that's growing there, from what I understand. But you know, Georgia Tech stinks at football, but they're pretty good at engineering. So <laughs> yeah. So I've been a Georgia Tech football fan for 20 years now, and that is a similar I'm to say I enjoy suffering. Uh, suffering is is great. <laughs> But I'm hoping that uh, new coach, new you know, new approach, and things will improve. So. <laughs> I'm always rooting for him. Um, you know, my boss over here is a tech grad, and uh, yeah, you know, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, his girls went to Georgia, which he actually loves because he likes to root for winners in football. So <laughs> <laughs> it, work, it works out, it works out for him. So I'm gonna, actually, you know, in the national championship, I was rooting for Georgia too. I was like, to hell with it. At least they're from Georgia. You know, like there's, uh, I don't yeah. care. It's, you know, close enough. I, yeah. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say I was, I'm a Georgia fan, but um, I like all my friends to be happy. So it was an easy thing to root for uh, the last couple of years and their, and their teams are really good. So that helps oh, yeah. too. Well, Matt, thank you for the time. I mean, we've, we've chewed up, uh, you know, 45 minutes talking about great tech and like the world and, you know, how y'all is offering at speed skills, you know, going to have a big impact on the way people do, you know, new applications, you know, cloud native focused applications. So we appreciate your time and the learning and we'll definitely keep in touch. Awesome. Thanks guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks a lot. Dynatrace exists to make the world software work perfectly. Their unified software intelligence platform combines broad and deep observability and continuous runtime application security with the most advanced AI ops to provide answers and intelligent automation from data at an enormous scale. This enables innovators to modernize and automate cloud operations, deliver software faster and more securely, and ensure flawless digital experiences. That is why the world's largest organizations trust Dynatrace to accelerate digital transformation. 